Hello, my name is John Meyer, and I'm the Patent and Trademark Resource Center Librarian for Penn State. This presentation is intended to help you understand the different types of intellectual property, copyright, patents, trademarks, and trade secrets. Then the process and benefit of obtaining a patent will be discussed. Finally, patent searching, which is important for determining if an idea is already patented, will be introduced with basic and advanced examples. You can find all the information from this presentation, plus many more sources on the research guide listed below. There also is a self-paced tutorial on patent searching in the tutorial section of that guide. As a Patent and Trademark Resource Center, Penn State University Libraries has a mission to support both our students and the public in finding patent and trademark information along with locating application materials. You can contact me or any other Penn State librarian to schedule a consultation appointment or send any questions to us as email. However, we cannot provide legal advice and will not do searches for you. There are four main types of intellectual property. Patents, copyright, and trademark are public registrations with the government that give you a limited monopoly on an idea of creative work. Trade secrets are protected by law but do not require registration. Each of these protects a different type of work. For example, patents exclude others from making, using, or selling your idea whereas copyright protects an original creative work. Trademarks protect the logo or name of a product or service in a particular industry. There are actually three types of patents in the United States. Utility patents are what most people commonly understand as an invention, either a device or a process. Design patents have no functional novelty, but they can be granted for a purely ornamental design. Plant patents are not genetic patents, like GMO corn, but are based on traditional plant breeding. So look at this example. What is the intellectual property in this device? What do you think is protected by copyright? What is protected by trademark? What patents are there in this device? And finally, are there trade secrets protected within this example? So for this mobile phone, there are many trademarks. There's the Apple logo, both the name Apple and the picture of an Apple. The product name itself is a trademark, iPhone. A lot is protected by copyright, both for someone who owns it, the pictures taken by it, some of the music on it is the creation of a musician, and the software running on the device is copyright of either Apple or the developer who created it. There are so many patents, it's hard to list them all. But some examples are the circuits, the touch screen, battery, antenna, speaker, anything that's related to how it works. But there are also many design patents. Apple is very famous for their unique designs, and they have patented some of them, such as the overall look of the iPhone. Finally, there are trade secrets, so many we might not even know, because they're not publicly disclosed. So each of those types of intellectual property has a different duration of protection. After this expires, anyone can use it. It becomes part of what's called the public domain. So copyright has been extended many times. Right now it's the life of the author plus 70 years. So it sometimes keeps getting long, longer. Utility patents used to be 14 years, but were changed to 20. Design patents are still 14 years. Trademarks can be renewed indefinitely as long as the product or service is still being sold. And trade secrets have no set term of protection. They last as long as the secret can be kept. There are other requirements for intellectual property. For example, copyright does not actually require registration. Copyright is secured as soon as you create something, whether it's a writing an email or taking a photograph, you already have copyright over that. However, registration does provide some advantages. For example, in court, there is a proof of the date of copyright and other documentation associated with registration. There are some restrictions on what can be copyrighted. You cannot copyright facts, such as taking the temperature of the weather outside. The cost of a copyright is less than that of patents or trademarks and can be usually less than $100. Trademarks protect your brand, company, or product from confusion in the marketplace. It can be almost anything, words, an image, even a sound or a color. 
You can't copy a current trademark, and you have to already be using it when you register. You can file for it with an intent to use, which means that you have a year from when you register until you can provide proof that you're selling your service or product. You can see here are some examples of Penn State University's many trademarks. Trademarks are in general less expensive than patents, but more expensive than copyright. I'm going to talk about trade secrets before patents. Because they don't generally they don't require registration, but you must keep documentation of efforts you made to keep the secret. They don't protect against every eventuality. So for example, if something is reverse engineered or is independently discovered, then it wasn't stolen and trade secrets will not protect it. What are some things you might use trade secrets to protect? It could be a customer list, product formula, or search algorithm. Algorithms may or may not be patentable, so they're often kept secret. Patents offer the broadest protection of any intellectual property, since they can be used to stop others from making, selling, or even importing your invention. It even protects you from someone independently coming up with the idea on their own. But there are more requirements to gaining a patent than any other type of intellectual property. First, it must satisfy utility, which means it has to work. Though you don't have to submit a prototype, the patent examiner is usually a scientist or engineer and must understand how it works. It also must be new or novel. That means there's no prior art or earlier examples of the idea. Currently in the U.S., there's a 12-month grace period after you make your invention public when only you can apply for a patent on the idea. Otherwise, no one can apply for ideas that are already, in the pub already known. Finally, the Patent Office has to decide whether the invention is non-obvious. It's their judgment on how great an improvement over current technology or existing art the invention is. Let's look at an example of a patent application that failed. See if you can figure out why. The title is Technical and Theoretical Specifications for Warp Drive Technology. Which test does that fail? Well, it doesn't have utility since it doesn't actually work. It's just theoretical. So that's why this patent application wouldn't fail, as well as those for time machines. What about novelty? So here's an example on some of someone else's prior publication of an idea would prevent you from getting a patent, even if you can prove you were the first to invent it. This is a change in the US law since 2013, when inventors could keep notebooks and prove they were the first to invent. In this case, even though Green invented first, Smith published first, therefore it is prior art, so Green's patent application would fail. Here's a handy flowchart that explains how you can test prior publications for whether they would stop a patent from being obtained. Prior art can be anything. It could be previous patents, but it could also be news or scientific research articles. Finally, the Patent Office does the test for non-obviousness. They look for an inventive step, which shows how much the patent application overcomes a technical problem better than existing technology. Patent examiners, again, are engineers and scientists or people who have worked in the industry, so they're skilled in the art of examining. It doesn't have to be obvious to a person on the street, but if it's obvious to someone working in the industry, then the patent application will fail. So that gives a range of what is patentable. If your invention claims something very broad, like I invented email, then it's unlikely to be patentable. There are also many prior inventions that already do that. But if you claim a very narrow improvement, it will only protect that specific example. So later, when you try to block someone from infringing on your patent, you may not even be able to stop them. So you want to balance an approach between a too narrow and too broad of a patent application. All right, so if it satisfies those requirements, how long does it take for a patent to be approved? Well, they've been reducing the amount of time for response on patents, but it's still very long. Copyright is almost instantaneous, very short registration, and trademarks generally take less than a year. However, patents take almost an average of three years. 
It can vary by area of technology. You can find out on the USP2 website or ask me and I can investigate it for you. Part of what takes patents so long to be approved is that it has to go through an examination process and there are thousands of patents filed every day so examiners often have many to go through. The process looks something like this. There's a back and forth between the applicant and examiner, which may include a number of rejections or objections to parts of the application. Sometimes examiners will even talk with an inventor on the phone to explain what their reasoning is. The result is either a final allowance, that's granted patent, or there's an appeal by the applicant for a final rejection. Also, the application could just be abandoned by the inventor. I often get asked, how much does it cost to get a patent? Well, these are the fees that the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office charges for getting a patent and maintaining it for up to the 20 years it's allowed. Large entities, such as Apple, pay the most, while small entities and universities pay half. A micro-entity is a new category. Many independent inventors and star startups fall under this. You can have no more than four filed patent applications and you have to have a, be under their maximum income limit. However, the overall cost of a patent is generally much higher when you consider legal fees. An attorney representing an inventor will charge for every hour they spend on the case, including corresponding with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So each step in the process breaks down to these types of costs. Also, if it's an international application, such, which is called a PCT, or Patent Cooperation Treaty, to get patents in more than just the United States, you also have to pay those offices separately. So the average cost can be almost $20,000. But this is highly variable. So what is the benefit to investing in a patent? Well, the intellectual property can then be used to either make the item or enter a contract called a license with another party to create the idea. You can also sue for damages or lost profits, but you have to bring the lawsuit yourself. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office does not prosecute patent infringement. Here's an example. Uh, Apple was involved in a lawsuit with Samsung where they were awarded over a billion dollars in damages for just six patents. So in some cases, one patent can be worth millions of dollars. So why is patent searching important? Well, it can save you money. You can be sure that your invention hasn't been done before. You can also save money where a patent attorney does charge for patent searching. You can also avoid early rejection from the patent office by showing them the prior art and explaining how your invention is different. If you're not applying for a patent, you can also use patent searching to inform a business plan. You can identify competitors or potential clients doing this searching. So in order to search effectively for patents, you need to understand how a patent looks and the information it contains. The title of the invention is usually not useful, since it's not the same as the name of the product. For example, most of Apple's patents are for computing device. The patent number is a unique identifying code, so you can actually find the patent no matter where you search. They're usually of the form country, which is a two-letter code, then a number, and then A for application or B for a patent. Design patents, which are only granted in the United States, also begin with a D. The inventors are also useful, since they're everyone who contributed to actually solving the technical problem. It's not the company or the business owner, so it never changes over time. The assignee is the current patent owner, which can be a company or a law firm, or an individual. The filing date for a patent application is very useful for utility patents, since they expire 20 years after it's filed. And the issue date is useful for design patents, since they expire 14 years after the issue date. International classification, or INTCL, US classification, and CPC, or cooperative patent classification, are areas where the technolo technology fits. 
And these are categories used by the Patent and Trademark Office, so they're consistent and very powerful for searching. Finally, there could be references cited of previous patents or news and research articles that are similar but not the same as the current invention. There are also represent a number of representative drawings which help with the description of the patent. The majority of pages list the background, detailed description, including references to the images, as well as a way to explain how it actually works. The last part of the patent, which is short but very important, are the claims. These define the legal boundary of the patent. They're often written by patent experts, lawyers, because that is what is used in court to decide later what is protected by the patent. They can be independent claims such as 1A method comprising the placing of an order or dependent claims such as 2, the method of claim 1, whereas. So it's often good to consult a patent attorney or legal expert with respect to claims, but there are also books for helping to write claims. You can take these parts of a patent and use them for different types of searching. If you know the patent number, it is very easy to find the patent. Sometimes products will have the patent number printed on them, or it could be listed on the company website. Often Wikipedia will have a guess at the patent number of a product. You can also search by a known aspect such as an inventor or the company that owns it. But to be the most thorough so you don't miss any patents, it's best to use classification searching. Since the Patent Office groups all inventions in one technology area into classifications, you can limit where you search to just the area that applies to your idea. Here's an example of the Cooperative Patent Classification, or CPC, system. You can see A is Human Necessities, 01 is Agriculture, B is Soil Working Machines, 33 is Tilling Implements, and 8 is Tools. Each level has fewer patents to search. So while Section A has millions of patents, subgroup A01B33-8 has only a few thousand patents. Here are some patent tools to help you search. They have disadvantages and advantages. The U.S. Patent and Trademarks patent searches, they have one for patents and one for applications, has only limited searching prior to 1976 the patent number, issue date, or classification. The advantage of the USPTO system is that it's very current and reflect changes that happen to the patent. The second search interface is Google Patents. It's very easy to use and uses scanned copies of patents to provide full text searching, even back to the first patents in the United States. The data is not as current and can be a few weeks behind, but Google links to the US Patent Office and other patent offices for the data. They also include some countries beyond the U.S. and include them in the same system. It also has an algorithm for prior art searching, which attempts to find earlier patents, books, websites, or research papers. Finally, the European Patent Office, ESPOSNET, has the most countries and is truly a worldwide patent search. And they also have a very easy-to-use Cooperative Patent Classification CPC search tool. Here are a number of examples for each type of search. Patent number searching in PetFT, if you know the number you want. Keyword searching, if you know some aspect of the invention you're looking for. Or classification searching, if you only know the technology area. Take a while to watch each of these videos before returning to the presentation. I want you to know you can always ask me for help, no matter if you're a Penn State student, staff, faculty member, alumni, or just a resident of Pennsylvania. We provide handouts and help from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, along with books and resources on patent and trademarks. Please use the research guide and the tutorials available online for more help, and thank you for watching this presentation.